And so as we get into this today, again, I said open up to Exodus chapter 4. We're going to pick up there, and we are going to read a lot of Scripture today. And uh, so you can take notes and, and things as well. If you have your Bible, open it up. But I just want to challenge you that when we read the Word of God, not to just read this as a storybook. And, you know, the stories that we're going to talk about today, a lot of them we have heard before. And as a kid, you've probably uh, read them. If you were in, uh, if you grew up in Sunday school or anything like that, you've had them taught to you. If you're a parent who reads the Bible to their kids, you probably read through some of these stories. And so it's very easy sometimes to read the story and just be like, oh, yeah, I know what that means. But I, I want to share this morning and talk through this and, and, and realize that, yes, these stories about real people, real events that took place, but a lot of these stories are symbolic of what God wants to do in our life. You remember we started off this series talking about Exodus and, and, and how the, uh, uh, we revealed how the enemy tries to attack in our life. If you miss any sermons in this sermon series, I challenge you to go back and pick this up because it's going to build up. Uh, on, on each one builds on each other. But today we're going to hit fast forward a little bit. And so y'all are going to have to listen quick as I go through uh, some of these scriptures and things. But again, I don't want you to think about it as a storybook. I want you to realize God's word is living and active and that there, there are things that we can pull from this where that we can get understanding in things of how our life works. Even though the book of Exodus is about uh, the children of Israel coming out of bondage. Listen, guys, the, the book of Exodus is also about us coming out of our bondage. And if we will look at it, we will see the way that the enemy tries to attack. We will see even as we're helping lead other people out of bondage and into freedom, how the enemy is going to hold them back. And it will help us even to know how to minister to people where they are in whatever situation and circumstance they find themselves in as they're coming to God. And so I'm going to fast forward real quick through some scripture. In Exodus chapter 3 is where we left off. And we left off at the burning bush. At the burning bush, God speaks to Moses. Moses uh, is like afraid to, to go out and to do what God's called him to do. And so he's, he's like, well, how can I do this? Who, who shall I say will send me? And God says, tell him that I am that I am was, has sent you. And, and, and so then he, he's still afraid. And, and so God asked Moses, he says, what do you have in your hand? And he said, I've got a rod. And he said, well, throw the shepherd's staff down. Throw your rod down. And it turned into a snake. He tells him to pick it up. It turns right back into the rod. And then he tells him, put his hand in his coat. He pulls it out. It's leprous. He puts it back in. It's healed. Like he shows him these things. And, and still, Moses is scared and, and, and fearful. And he starts saying, but I, I can't speak. And so God looks at him and he says, who is it that made man's mouth? And, and, you know, Moses knows the answer to that, you know, that it was God. And then he says, but I'm going to send uh, your brother to you. And your brother Aaron is on his way, and he'll speak for you for a period of time, okay? And so that's where we're going to pick up is they are getting ready to go into Egypt. So in chapter 4, verse 20, it says that Moses took his wife and his sons and he had them ride on a donkey and he went back to the land of Egypt and God took this and Moses took the staff of God in his hands. And, uh, and the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do uh, all the miracles before Pharaoh that I have put in your power, and I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. And so here God tells Moses, the miracles that I just showed you how to do with the, the staff and with your hand, go do those things, but Pharaoh is not going to let the people go. In fact, I'm going to harden his heart. So God is basically sending Moses on a mission that is, is, is going to be unsuccessful. He's asking him, like, will you do this even if you know the results aren't going to turn out the way that you hope that they would? Now, how many of us, if we're honest, would take God up on that? I'm going to send you, let's think about this, let's, let's put it in modern. I'm going to send you to the bush in Africa, and you're going to live without running water and without electricity and everything. And you're going to go, and you're going to give your life to preach the word of God in this community. Oh, but nobody's going to be saved. Are you moving to Africa? 
Come on, let's be honest. You know, probably not. We're going to have to have a little bit of convincing to, to make that step. And so God tells him that, that this isn't going to uh, be successful. He tells, you know, uh, he says, then uh, I want you to go to say to Pharaoh, that, uh, that thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn. And I will say to you, let my people go, so, my, let my son go, that they may serve me. If you refuse to let my people go, behold, I will kill your firstborn. And I want to stop real quick because if we're not careful, we'll overlook what's going on here. One, God tells him from the very beginning, I'm going to send you, but I'm going to, fa- I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. He's not going to let the people go. So it, it seems like it's going to be unsuccessful. But two, when he says that if you don't let my people go, I'm going to kill your firstborn. Does anybody remember what the 10th plague was? The 10th plague going through Egypt was the death of the firstborn son, whether, whether that was of man or animal. What does that show us? That from the very beginning, God knew exactly how this was going to end. That even though it was going to be unsuccessful in the beginning, he knew the very end of it. That should bring a little bit of uh, faith to us and less fear that when we know God calls us to go step out and do things, even if it may be some days where things seem unsuccessful, he knows the end result. And so we don't have to be afraid of the future because we know that God already holds the future. That he, he, he's written out every day of our life before we even live one. God knew how this story was going to end up. Skip on down to verse 29. It says, then Moses and Aaron went and they gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses. And he did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And so Aaron and Moses go and they bring this word that that you're going to be delivered. God is going to pull you out of bondage and it says that the people believed. And it says, and when they uh, heard uh, that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their afflictions, they bowed their heads and they worshiped. So not only did they believe, but on, upon hearing the word of God, uh, that they're going to be set free and that God had remembered them, that God had seen them, it moved them in their hearts so much that they even began to worship God. Go on in chapter 5. It says, afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they can hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is this Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. And then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice uh, uh, unto our God, lest uh, he fall upon us in a pestilence or with sword. And so he's trying to convince, uh, trying to convince Pharaoh, you've really got to let us go because if you don't, like, it's not going to be good if we're, if we're disobeying God. It says, but the king of Egypt said to him, Uh, To them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take your people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of Israel are now many, and and you make them rest from their burdens? The same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, saying, you shall not give the people straw to make bricks, as they did in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves." And so here, God tells Moses to go do this. Moses goes and does this, and Pharaoh begins to talk to his taskmasters and say, you know what, these people, they don't have enough to do. You need to give them more work. Now, if you missed the first uh, sermon in this series, we talked about that those taskmasters, the word there for taskmasters is the Hebrew word sar, and sar means a prince or a ruler. And we talked about how that even is the same word when it talks about the prince of Persia in Daniel chapter 10, that he was a demonic force that was holding back the answer from God to move. And, and, and that this word taskmasters, if you're looking at it like in a spiritual sense or symbolic sense, this is like uh, the enemy's d- demons trying to hold back the answers. And so this would be like Pharaoh telling the people, you need to 
uh, go and oppress the people, uh, telling his, his cohorts and his demons, go and oppress the people even more with more work. Go put more on them. Now, I want to stop real quick and kind of set this up because I think this is very important. You know, when we started out the series, I know a lot of people uh, look at uh, Exodus uh, chapter 14 when, they, when God parts the Red Sea and, and, they, and, and they walk across on dry land and, and then the water comes in and collapses on Pharaoh and, and it washes away all of Pharaoh's armies, armies never to be seen again. A lot of people will tell you that's a type and a shadow or it's symbolic of salvation, right? How many of you ever heard that before? Because it's the Red Sea. The blood of Jesus is red. It wipes out the enemy's attack and all of those things. Okay, so let's think about this. Now, we're in the book of Exodus, and the book of Exodus is a chronological book. It's telling it in the order. Have we gotten to the Red Sea yet? We're, we're in chapter 4, 5. Yeah, 5 right now, and we have not seen the Red Sea yet. We're still before the Red Sea. So if the Red Sea equals salvation. How many of you remember number lines from math class in school? Anybody of y'all remember that? A couple of you, okay? For those of you who don't, a number line would basically like you have zero, but then to the left you have one and two and three and it kind of counts up, right? But then to the right of zero you have negative one, negative two, negative three, and it counts backwards, right? Now y'all remember the, the, the thing I'm talking about in a number line? Okay, so if the Red Sea is zero, and that's salvation, then everything that we're reading is before salvation. So we're in the negative numbers right now. Okay, so when you think about children of Israel, I don't want you to think believers who are already saved. I want you to think people who have not come to the point of salvation yet, because in, chrono in chronological order, they haven't, they haven't encountered the Red Sea yet. Are y'all with me? All right, so now this shows us a couple things. One, it shows us even sometimes when we're trying to, uh, you know, when there's, there's people who are unbelievers and we're trying to minister to them and we're trying to encourage them to come to church and we're trying to help them in their walk with God and we see them get set back. Let's, let's kind of paint this scenario. How many of you have started, uh, you, you bring somebody to church and they feel like God spoke something to them. They encountered God. They even were touched by God. They even may have worshipped God. They may have prayed to God or something like that. And then you go a little bit of time. And maybe they're coming a little bit here and there. But then they get busy with work. And then they, they start having to work overtime. Or their kids get sick. Or their car breaks down. Or something in life happens. And then all, it, it seems like all that happened, it was like they were right there. They just worshipped God. They prayed to God. And now they're not even coming to church. Anybody Ever seen that before? This is, the, this is what the enemy does. Here, they bowed, they heard the word that God wanted to deliver them and that God remembered them and they were so moved to it that they bowed their heads in worship. But then Pharaoh saw what was happening and Pharaoh sent more work to distract them, to burden them, to keep them away from getting to the point of the Red Sea. Do you see what's happening? So when, when we understand this we shouldn't get mad at them because now they're not coming to church and oh they're worthless and I give up on them I'm not inviting them anymore uh, they they you know came to church and now they're no 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 we need to realize what's going on in the spirit world that the enemy is trying to prevent them and we need to begin to pray against the effectiveness of the taskmasters and the distractions and things that the enemy tries to send to hold them back so he gives them more work uh, verse 8 says but the Number of bricks has to stay the same. And he said, you can't reduce it because they're idle. And, uh, and, and now, because they're idle, they cry out, let us go offer uh, a sacrifice to our God. But let the heavier work be laid upon the men that they would lay and have no regard to these lying words. I love that. These lying words. What's the enemy trying to prevent, uh, trying to get them to believe? That they can't be saved, that they can't be delivered, that they're always going to be in bondage. And the enemy is calling the lying words, the words that God sees you, he knows you, and he wants to bring you out of bondage. And he's saying, I, I want to weigh them down so that they don't even entertain these words that the enemy says are lies, but we know as being truth. 
It says so the taskmasters went, and I'm just going to kind of paraphrase through this some. Uh, they went and made them go uh, get straw for themselves, and, and the taskmasters uh, made them, they were urgent on them, made them complete their tasks every single day. Uh, they were upset when, when they wouldn't do it. And verse 15 says that the foreman of the people of Israel, they came in and cried out to Pharaoh and said, why do you treat, us like, treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet you say to us, make bricks, and behold, your servants are beaten. And, and, but the fault is in your own people. But he says, you are idle. You are idle. This is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to God. Go now and work. No straw will be given to you. And you must deliver the same number of bricks. And it says, the foreman of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble. And, said, you, uh, and when they said, you shall by no means reduce the number of bricks. And so here they, they see like, this is getting worse. It seems like more work. Like even if you look at this, one of the things, one of the ways that the enemy tries to get people who are unbelievers to work is that when they begin to start taking steps toward God and they see their, their weaknesses or they see their sin that's in their life, they begin to try to clean themselves up to where they can encounter God. And they begin to get in this work mentality. If I can just stop smoking and stop cussing and stop doing drugs and, and stop doing this, then I can come to God and then I can be saved. What's he trying to do? He's trying to put work on them. He's trying to, trying to get them to think that their salvation or that their freedom is dependent upon the work. And it's not. It goes on and it says in verse 20, it says that they met Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to him, The Lord look upon you and judge us, because you have made a stink of us in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants. And you have put a sword in their hand to kill us. And so they're upset. They're mad. Like, you did this. We, you, you go to Pharaoh. Now Pharaoh's mad. He's making us work harder. And they're going to end up killing us because of all this hard work. Verse 22, Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done this evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak your name, he has done evil to these people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Now what's happening here? Moses is going through this faith crisis. Like, I went and did what you told me to do. And it got worse. God, not only did you not deliver, not only was this not successful, but now it's even harder on them. But what did God tell Moses when he went? He said, I am going to harden Pharaoh's heart, and he's not going to let your people go. So I'm sure... If I were God, this is what I would do. I would look down and be like, Moses, I told you he wasn't going to let the people. Don't you listen to anything. I told you I was going to harden his heart. You know what? Just give me somebody else. You don't listen. Like, I mean, that, that would have been my response, you know. But God didn't do that. Chapter 6, verse 1, it says, but the Lord said to Moses, now you shall see what I'm about to do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will even drive them out of his land. I love that. God is not concerned about all this. God, again, God knew what the end was going to be before they even started the thing. And he's like, oh, Moses, Moses, Moses. <laughs> Son, you don't even know what I'm about to do to Pharaoh. I'm going to drive, I'm going to drive them out. In, in fact, I'm going to make Pharaoh so bewildered in things that he's going to drive them out of the land himself. He's not only going to let them go, but he's going to force them out and tell them to go. It says that God spoke to Moses and said to him, I'm the Lord. I remember, I, I appeared to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob at, uh, as God Almighty. By my name, the Lord, I did not make, my, uh, I make myself known. I 
also establish my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan and the land of the, the, to, that they lived in as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groanings of their people. Y'all remember what, what I taught the, the first time that God sees, God hears, and that God knows, or God sees, God hears, he knows, and, and then another one that I said could be put in there. Remembered, I have heard the groanings of the people from the Egyptians, the slaves, and I remembered my covenant. Therefore, uh, to the people, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of, of the Egyptians, and I will deliver them uh, deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with my outstretched hands uh, and with great acts. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you will know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from these burdens of the Egyptians. And I will not only bring you out, but I will bring you into the land that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a possession because I am the Lord. And then Moses went and he spoke this to the people. It says, but they didn't even listen to Moses because they had a broken spirit and they had been under harsh slavery. Now, when God responds to Moses, God is just simply reminding Moses, like, I'm God. I'm the God that appeared to Abraham. You remember Abraham who... His wife gave birth to a son when he was 100 years old, and Sarah, who, like, I did that. Isaac, I called Isaac, and I revealed myself to him. Jacob, I called Jacob, and I revealed myself to him. Like, he's reminding him. And, and, and you notice the phrase he kept saying, he's like, I'm the Lord. Like, there's power in that. I think sometimes we're like, Oh, yes, Jesus, your Lord. And we, we just think of it like it's this empty, powerless statement. But God kept repeating it like, I am the Lord. Like, do you really think I'm afraid of Pharaoh? I am the Lord. We've got to realize no matter what we're facing in, in life, we serve the Lord. And he's still the Lord, the maker of the heavens and earth, the one who spoke and the worlds came into existence. Y'all are so quiet in here. My goodness. I hope Summersville's shouting me down back there. I mean, Moses could have easily said, this thing's getting worse. It's not getting better. I, I need to just get out of here. But he didn't. Verse 10 says, the Lord said to Moses, you need to go in and you need to tell Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to let the people go out of this land. But, the Lord, uh, but Moses said to the Lord, but, but behold, I, 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 uh, the people of Israel, they didn't listen to me. How then shall uh, Pharaoh listen to me? Because I'm a man of uncircumcised lips. That phrase, uncircumcised lips, is the same phrase and thing that he used at the burning bush that basically means I, I can't speak. I, I'm of unskilled uh, labor. I, I, I'm not able to speak. And, and then he goes on in verse 28, and it says, The Lord spoke to him again in the land of Egypt, and he said, I am the Lord your God. Uh, uh, I, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses again said, I am a, of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? All he's doing is repeating his inadequacies. He's repeating the things that, that I can't do in and of his own ability. But I love this. This is actually the, the third time that he tells God that he can't speak, and God still keeps coming and telling him to speak. Like he's not, he's got, we got to understand something. God is not impressed by our abilities and he is not scared or afraid to use us in our inabilities. Because it's not about us and our abilities and our strength. Instead, it says, the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. And you will speak all of the things that I command. And your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let my people go. But I will harden his heart. But, through a multi, uh, but I will multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, but Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand up on Egypt and bring my host and my people, the children of Israel, uh, out, of, 
out of, uh, out of the land of Egypt by great judgment. And then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord God when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring my people out from among them. God just goes on. He continues the, the, the commands and he continues the purpose even though Moses doesn't think he's able to do it. He says, I'm going to move. Pharaoh's heart's going to be hardened. He's not going to listen to you, but it's okay because I'm going to show some mighty acts. And through these mighty acts, all of the Egyptians are going to know that I am the Lord God. He starts sending the plagues. The first plague was the water being turned into blood. And it said that Moses stretched out his, his uh, staff over the, the Nile River and all the water in the Nile turned to blood. But not only all the Nile water in the Nile says every little pool, lake, pond, anything that was throughout all of Egypt turned into blood. And it, and it was this way for uh, seven days. And then <clears throat> in verse 22, it says... But the, the magicians of Egypt were able to do the same thing through their secret arts. And so Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord said. Pharaoh turned, and he went out of his house, and he did not even take this to heart. So the first plague, you know, he goes in and performs this one miracle, and, and, and I'm sure Moses wishes this is going to be it, but God had already told him it's not going to work that way. It's going to be multiple plagues and things that take place. Pharaoh's heart's hardened because uh, the Egyptian uh, mag magicians were able to, to do the same thing. Then he goes on, uh, and there's a second plague that comes, and it's their houses, the, the Nile River frogs come out of the Nile River, and they start filling their houses and, and everything. And so everywhere you look, there are frogs. In your bed, there's frogs. There's, oh, there's all this you know, everywhere, in, coming out of your pots on your stove, in your food, in, everywhere you turn, there's nothing but frogs. And God, and Moses comes back to Pharaoh, and, and, and Pharaoh's like, we pray to God that these frogs will leave. And, and, and uh, he's like, okay, when do you want them to leave? And Pharaoh's like, um, tomorrow? Come on, if you had frogs in your bed, how many of you would be like, right now? Like, let's get these things out of here now. But it says that once they were removed, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He'd go on to the third plague, and there were gnats everywhere. It says Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He refused to listen. Fourth plague, not, small little bugs wasn't enough, so he sent flies this time instead of gnats. And there were flies everywhere. But this plague begins something that looked a little bit different. In uh, chapter 8, verse 22, it says this. He says, I'm going to set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies will be there. And uh, that you may know that I am the Lord God in the midst of the earth. I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this will be a sign as it happens. And the Lord did so. There came a great swarm of flies in the house of Pharaoh and his servants' houses and throughout all of the land of Egypt, and they were ruined by the swarms of flies. But you know where there was no flies? In Goshen, where the children of Israel were. So Pharaoh sees something in this. He sees that there's some power and, and things, and so he, he begins to try to negotiate with, uh, with uh, Moses a little bit. And it says, Pharaoh called for Moses and said, go and sacrifice within the land. But Moses said it wouldn't be right for us to do this because the things that they were going to sacrifice were an abomination to the Egyptians. And he even told them that if we do this, if we sacrifice in front of them, then they may stone us to death. But instead, let us go on a three-day journey and then we're going to go sacrifice to the Lord as, as he told us to, and, and Pharaoh said, I'm going to let you go sacrifice to the Lord in the wilderness, but you can't go very far, so plead, uh, plead for me. And it says that Moses said, behold, I'm going out from you, and I will plead with the Lord for the swarms of flies so that they may depart from Pharaoh and, and from his servants and from, uh, tomorrow, uh, from the people tomorrow. Only let not Pharaoh cheat again, by uh, letting the people not sacrifice to the Lord. And so he says, okay, I'm going to pray them away, but you better do what you say you're going to do. He says, Moses went out. He prayed to the Lord. 
And uh, the Lord did as Moses asked. He removed the flies uh, from his servants and from the, the people. And not one single fly remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. And he did not let the people go. Fifth plague was all of the Egyptian livestock dies. But all the, uh, the Israelites' livestock is still alive. Sixth plague, boils break out all over the, the Egyptians. And they're in this extreme pain and torment and everything. Seventh plague, there's hell that falls from the ground. And huge thunderstorms with giant hell that falls and begins to destroy all of the crops and everything. In Egypt, but not in Goshen. See, there's this protection that God is watching over and protecting people. That he, even though things are going on to the oppressor and he's attacking the enemy, he's not attacking the people. Guys, we have to understand that when God does things in our life, a lot of times he's, he's fighting the enemy who is fighting us. He's not fighting us directly. We may see the results of it. The children of Israel saw the flies. They saw the, the, the land being destroyed. They, they saw the livestock dying. They probably had a smell, some of the smell. Can you imagine if every bit of animals in an entire country died, what the smell would be like? Like, I mean, there's, there's some level of discomfort and stuff that they have because of this, the, the attack that's going on at the enemy But I want you to recognize God is not using his anger toward his people. He's not using his anger toward the people that he's trying to pull out of slavery. And God does not direct his anger at us when we're lost. He doesn't direct it at the the people that are lost. He actually fights against the enemy that is holding them bound. You go on in Exodus chapter 9. Verse 27, it says, Pharaoh called to him and said to him, after the hell, that uh, this time I have sinned and the Lord is right. And I and my people are in the wrong. So plead with the Lord, that uh, for there has been enough of God's thunder in hell. And I will let you go and you shall stay no longer. And so he, again, promises that he's going to let him go. Moses goes and prays. The thunder and the hell stops. Verse 34, but Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hell and the thunder had ceased. Yet he sinned again and he hardened his heart. He and his servants so that the heart of Pharaoh was hardened and he did not let the people of Israel go just as God had spoken through Moses. Now, that phrase, just as God had spoken through Moses, it's not God spoke that they're supposed to go, and he didn't. It's God had spoken that he wasn't going to let him go. Like Again, there are constant reminders through this of God's sovereignty and how he knows how to do these things. How, 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 it's in control even when we don't understand the things. Moves on to the eighth plague, and the eighth plague was locusts. And locusts it began to eat up all of the the land and the vegetables and the things that, that hadn't been destroyed by the hell, the only things that were remaining were now being eaten by locusts. And, and the Egyptians themselves began to turn against Pharaoh in, in Exodus chapter 10, verse 7. It says that Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long uh, shall this man be a snare to us? Let the men go so that they may serve their God. Do, not, do you not understand that Egypt is in ruin? And so they brought back Moses and Aaron, and they brought him to Pharaoh. And he said to him, go serve the Lord your God, but, uh, but which ones are going to go? And it says, Moses said, we will go with all of our young and our old. We will go with our sons and our daughters and with our flocks and our herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. But he said to him, the Lord be with you if, you ever, if I ever let you or your little ones go. Look, you have some evil in mind. No, go, the men among you, and serve the Lord. For, uh, what you are, uh, uh, for that is what you are asking. If you, uh, and, and they were driven out from among Pharaoh's presence. So he says, he, again, he's trying to negotiate. First round is, you can worship God inside of this. Which honestly is what a lot of Christianity has been watered down to. You can serve God and live in bondage. 
You don't have to change your lifestyle. Pray a prayer, and you can serve God with your mouth and still live in the bondage of Egypt. That's the first layer of negotiation. That didn't work. So now he's saying, okay, you can go, but you can't take your children. I I love this because I think Joshua hears this as as it's being told and, and it's written and everything. And that's why Joshua said in, in Joshua 24, I think it's verse 5, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. It's not, it's not just for me. Me and my house. We're going we're to serve the Lord. And he tried to get him to settle for less than what, what uh, God had for him. He sends the ninth plague. And the ninth plague was darkness in, uh, in all of Egypt. But there was still light in Goshen. It goes on, uh, verse 24 of chapter 10. It says that uh, Pharaoh called for Moses and said, Go serve the Lord's, only your little ones may also go with you, but only leave your flocks and your herds behind. But Moses said, You must, not, uh, you must also let our sacrifices uh, and our burnt off. We, we must also go and have sacrifices and burnt offering that we would sacrifice to our Lord. Our livestock must go with us, and not one hoof will be left behind, for we must take them to serve the Lord our God. And we do not uh, know uh, with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. It's like we don't know what God's going to ask of us. And we're not going to show up to serve God empty-handed. He says, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he wouldn't let him go. And then Pharaoh said, get away from me. And take care never to let me see your face again. For on the day that I see your face, you would die. What's he offering here? He's offering a life of service without sacrifice. This is the same offer that is throughout the American church. You can serve God and you can still keep your will. You can still live the life that you want. You can still keep all your hobbies. You, you can serve God. You don't, you don't have to tithe. You don't have to go to church consistently. You can serve him. But don't sacrifice to him. You can serve him with your abilities, but... Don't offer him your treasures. Don't offer him your possessions. You can hold back those things. You see, this is the same bargaining that the devil does with people today. You can go to God and you can serve in the nursery. You can serve in five-star or a greeter and usher. You can go to food truck and serve. Don't offer everything to God. That's just extreme. Keys, you can come on up. Guys, listen, this is why, you know, last year, when God started moving in that boys' life group, starts out with a testimony of some boys who had been raised in church their whole life. You know, one of them was one of my was was my son. He was part of that group and raised in church. They've helped do things around church. They go to Christian school. But yet when they start hearing about salvation, one of them asked the question, would I know if I was really saved? And last week we talked about how. The Bible says that the power of God that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of you. And so my simple question is this. If something powerful enough to raise a man who's been in a grave for three days, who is beaten beyond recognition from the dead to life, is inside of you, do you think you would know it? And I remember when they interviewed those boys in that school chapel 
And, and the, the boys were like, yes, you would know it. Because I'm telling you, when they prayed that prayer, they were running through the church telling everybody. They were like, yeah, we just got saved. And, and then they'd be like, oh, my goodness, what is this verse? What is it? This, this passage of Scripture is coming to mind. And it would be like an address of a Scripture. And then they would open it up, and it would be about how now you are set free and brought into the kingdom of God and all of these things. And they're like, oh, my goodness, God is speaking to us in this moment. And they share about that, and in a Christian school, 60-some students start weeping and getting up and making their way, like jumping into the baptism and stuff. i got to give my heart to God. I, I've prayed prayers. I've done things, but I've never known this. And then from that, we had church staff who had been serving God, good moral people, done right things, pastors, kids, you know, raised in church, all of these different things, serving, serving, serving. But on the inside, they're like, wait a minute, I, I haven't had that type of experience. I haven't felt what they feel. And then they respond and say, okay, God, I want that come into my life. And then they're completely different people. And then I go to Uganda, and I'm preaching in a pastor's conference. Again, pastor's conference. These are people who get up every week and preach to their churches and their congregations and everything, sharing the Word of God, studying the Word of God, serving God with their lives. And we start sharing these testimonies and things. And 21 pastors stand up and say, I need to give my heart to God. I need to be saved. Listen, if you notice, we still haven't even hit the Red Sea yet. They are seeing miraculous things take place. They are seeing God protect them, even when other, I mean, all chaos is breaking loose, but they're protected. Everything is in darkness, but they have light. They're seeing God's obvious hand upon them, but they haven't hit the point of salvation yet. And then you hit plague number 10. Plague number 10 was the death angel that would go over. Now I want you to think about this. In Romans 6.23, what does it say? It says the wages of sin is death, right? But the gift of God is eternal life, right? They are told their instructions for protection over this is kill a spotless lamb Take the blood and apply it to the doorpost of your home. Y'all remember this story, this part of the story? But there's an important part in this story too. Eat all of the lamb. Again, this still isn't even hitting Red Sea salvation yet. Spotless lamb shed, blood shed. The price has been paid. But then there was a, the other part of it is they have to eat the lamb. Okay, what does the spotless lamb represent? Jesus, right? Okay, let's take a step, step farther because none of us are going to be gnawing on Jesus' arm and all that stuff like that. It's not, he's not asking us to be a cannibal and eat Jesus, okay? But John 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And verse 14 says, and the word came and dwelt among us in the flesh, and it was full of grace and mercy, grace and truth. That was Jesus, right? The blood has been paid, the price has been paid for us. Now we have to eat the word of God, and the command was not just eat some of it, eat all of it. Now, I'm not saying this means if you read through the Bible in a year, then that means you're saved. That's not what I'm saying. It's not works. But eating this means that I take it and it becomes a part of who I am. When I eat, the nutrients become a part of me. Right? When we eat this word, it becomes a part of who we are. And then guess what? The death angel passed by. And then Pharaoh's like, all right, grab everybody, get them out of here. And they're able to take all the plunders, and they start heading to the Red Sea, which is what? Point of salvation. They walk across the Red Sea. The enemy's destroyed behind them. And in chapter 14, it says they were never to be heard of from again. There are so many people who fully believe that they are completely saved and right with God 
who are still hovering around that negative one, negative two on that number line. They are so close to the point of salvation, but they don't want all of this. They don't want to surrender all of this to all of this. They don't want this to become who they are. They want Jesus to be Savior, not Lord. But if you want to walk in complete and total freedom, you got to eat all of this. This becomes who I am. Jesus is Lord. He says you've got to confess that Jesus is Lord, right, to be saved. That doesn't mean just sitting there. And, and a confession wasn't just like, I believe that Jesus is Lord. No, no, it was a, a Jesus is Lord. It's a confession with my mouth and with my lifestyle that he calls the shots. And when you step into that, the enemy is completely destroyed and you're completely free. How many people are hovering around right here? They're close to God. They're seeing the miracles of God. They're seeing the provisions of God. But they're still walking in bondage when the cross paid to set every single one of them completely free. And here's the amazing thing about these 10 plagues. These 10 plagues weren't just random things that God was like, oh, let's see, what are we going to come up with? I know we can make frogs come up. I know, let's turn the Nile River into blood. I know, let's make it really dark. Every one of these plagues represented an Egyptian God that God was proven that he was mightier than. The God Ra of the sun, <laughs> I will block him out and the only place there will be sun is, is on my children. They serve the Nile River and its power and everything. You know what? I'm going to turn that water into blood and everything in it's going to die until I say so. He showed he had complete control over it. What's he doing? He is systematically showing the Egyptian God that everything you're serving is not stronger than who he is. He is systematically proving to the Israelites who have grown up in Egyptian culture hearing about all of these gods, I am far greater than all of these gods. All you need is me to fight on your behalf and bring you in. See, the promised land, Rich, that's a great song we just sung, but it's, the, it's theologically incorrect because it says you take me out and straight into the promised land. They didn't go straight into the promised land. They got brought out into the Red Sea, and then they begin to walk with God and learn to walk with God and see his provision and everything on the way to the promised land. Salvation is zero. Then we start one, two, three, walking through the wilderness, hearing the voice of God, knowing God on the way to our promises. Guys, it's a process from the point where we're not saved and don't acknowledge God to the point of where we're saved and it continues on to where we're discipled and trained and grown our walk with God. And it's all right there in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus that we just read like, this is a really cool story. The water stood up on both sides and they went across on dry land. Guys, there's so much more to the word of God. If we'll take the time, study it and eat it and allow God to reveal himself to us through it.